yeah, that's the sort of outline of this talk. So we'll give, uh, I'll start giving a quick introduction on uh, urban traffic control, the sort of problems that we are facing, and let's say some more uh, traditional techniques which has been used and exploited in the past. Uh, then we will cover, Steve actually will cover, uh, the related works and the landscape from an AI perspective, mostly an AI perspective, and then we will cover three approaches uh, which are from planning and scheduling. Uh, and then we will close with some uh, future direction and conclusion, of course. Uh, now, the first question is probably what is uh, urban traffic control about? Uh, if you want to define it in a nutshell, uh, urban traffic control is just about dealing with traffic congestion and the overall goal which has been pursued in the past or which is pursued uh, traditionally by uh, approaches from engineers is minimizing the delay uh, for all the vehicles in the network or at least for the vehicles which are traveling uh, in the main corridors. So let's say urban traffic control is about minimizing delay. And you want to minimize delay in two uh, main situations, recurrent congestion, peak hours, so people which are going to work or people which are coming back home, basically every day or every working day at least, or unexpected disruption and accidents. Something happened which can be a flood, which can be a, tra uh, a car accident, uh, signals which are out of control. You have to deal with that in order to minimize the impact on vehicles which are traveling in your network. And uh, I think it's also important to give uh, a perspective on urban traffic control. So it's important to understand first, do we have a problem right now uh, worldwide in terms of traffic? And uh, I think we can easily answer yes, also on the basis of our own experience, uh, commuting every day, going to work, uh, going to shop, uh, and uh, bad news are that traffic congestion is, co is also increasing uh, worldwide. And on the one hand, because of the city immigration trend, so the city population is expected to grow and is currently growing uh, every year by 1%. And this is also leading to have more vehicles on the road because people prefer to use, still to use vehicles uh, rather than uh, public transport. So it is expected that in six years time, there will be two billion more vehicles on our road. So we have a problem now, and from this perspective, the problem uh, is going to last for a while. And uh, given a focus on the UK, because of course I'm working at the University of Huddersfield, so we have studied a bit uh, uh, the UK situation in terms of traffic. Uh, drivers spend 32 hours per year in traffic jam, so just stuck before, be, yeah without being able to do anything else. And this sort of congestion is also costing uh, to the UK economy, which is already stressed a bit by Brexit, uh, about 30 billion per year. <coughs> and of course, you have health issues on, from two perspectives. First, uh, traffic pollution, which is contributing to at least 14, 40, a thousand premature deaths. Now, this is at least because it's extremely difficult uh, to directly relate pollution with deaths because usually it's a concurrent cause and not the main one or the only one. Uh, but it can make things pretty bad for people which has also uh, other type of diseases going on or other weaknesses. Uh, and of course, you have traffic accidents which are also contributing to around 2,000 deaths per year. And uh, is this sort of problem, urban traffic control issues, congestion, a cost of the economy going to last, or uh, some new, let's say, paradigm changes, approaches, are going to make things easier for us without the need to apply controls uh, from a traffic authority perspective? And uh, from this area, there are two main elements which can be taken into account and that we are taking into account and has been studying in the last few years, I would say. One is mobility as a service. So the fact that people, particularly those which are living in large metropolitan areas, uh, don't want to own a car. Because if you own a car, you have to pay taxes on that. Uh, you have to care about maintenance. You have to find a way, a place for parking it. You have to take it, you have to park it overnight and the sort of things. So we don't want to have a car, but we want to have the service that the car provides. Uh, so this is called mobility as a service. When you need a car, you use an app, Uber or Lyft, for instance, uh, and the car arrives for you and moves you around. So you don't need the car, but 
you are exploiting the service in this way. And of course, the other thing, which is getting more and more important, is connected autonomous vehicles. So these sort of vehicles uh, that can drive themselves autonomously, not right now, but very likely in the near future, and that can connect with the other vehicles to perform some complex maneuver, like platooning and things like that, or which can also uh, be connected and communicate uh, uh, with the infrastructure uh, to optimize and smooth traffic. So on the bright side, speaking about optimism uh, for these sort of approaches, so mobility as a service and cuts, uh, there are points that indicate that they may relieve congestion in the long term, in the future. Uh, First of all, because the use of calves has the potential to improve the throughput of roads uh, by more than 100%. So we can basically double the capacity of roads without doing anything. Uh, because they can drive closer to each other, they can better exploit the space, uh, they have better timing for moving into junctions and the sort of things. Uh, and of course, you have also improved safety, better service, faster transport, so less accidents and less congestion. On the other end, uh, there are also points uh, that may indicate, uh, or according to an analysis made by that CTU Art project, uh, strongly points towards the direction uh, that uh, mobility as a service and controlled autonomous vehicles uh, will worsen the situation of traffic. So first point is that travel demand is expected to increase uh, because you can exploit mobility as a service uh, and it's more comfortable. And uh, this leads to an increase of a number of vehicles. Now, uh, maybe you realized you know, coming here or walking around towns or cities in the US, uh, how many vehicles are out there with Uber or Lyft uh, uh, signals on top of them? These vehicles wouldn't be around if we were not using mobility as a service. So they are already increasing the number of vehicles on the road. And this is expected to explode in the next few years, I think these projections were made for the next 10 years, between 30, 30, and 90%. So we can double the number of vehicles which are already uh, in our roads, basically destroying uh, any benefit that you can get from cars, for instance. And you have also reduction in multimodal journeys because if vehicles or if cars are cheap to use, uh, and it's pretty comfortable to use to you for use them. Why would you take a train? Why would you take a bus? So we do have a problem right now in terms of uh, traffic control, in, ter in terms of congestion, and it's very likely that the same problem will be here in the future, if not worse. So we need to do something, uh, and we need to do it now or as soon as possible. And uh, speaking about the traditional approaches, which has been used or which are used on a daily basis uh, for traffic control, uh, you can optimize traffic signal phases, uh, and then you have other techniques like variable message science, which are suggesting you to take uh, uh, deviation or to take different roads, variable speed limits, lanes reduction, uh, optimization of tolls, costs, and things like that. Uh, but when you're speaking about urban traffic control, so when you're speaking about urban areas, urban region, downtown of places, Usually, the only approach or the approach which can deliver uh, the best impact on the traffic is the optimization of traffic signal phases. So that will be the focus uh, of the rest of this talk. Uh, and of course, optimizing traffic signal phases can lead to issues. So it's not a matter of saying, uh, I'm optimizing the phases, I will solve the problem. You can make it worse, by far. Uh, and OK, this is a grid lock, uh, but that's not really important. And what is deployed? right now in, uh, in our roads. Uh, a large number of junctions are controlled using fixed time uh, traffic light phases. What does it mean fixed time? means that uh, the length of each phase of green and red has been optimized manually, usually using some simulators, uh, and is then exploited as it is uh, without any knowledge or without any information about the current situation of the traffic. You have your schedule which has been optimized, you are using it, from 8 a.m. in the morning to 10 a.m. in the morning, and then you are changing it. Uh, it can work, it, it tends to work pretty well if uh, the condition is as expected, otherwise uh, you have congestion. Uh, 
a few junction, a few connected junction can be controlled using techniques which are called SCOOT or SCAT, uh, which came basically from the 80s. Uh, so we're still reusing that sort of technologies. And uh, they are pretty fast for controlling a small number of junctions. I think that in the case of SCOOT, you can have up to seven or eight junctions which are connected. They can work pretty well for this small area, uh, but they don't know anything about the rest of the area. So they can improve the situation in the control area and make it much worse just outside uh, the small region. So if you are a traffic authority which is controlling the whole city, you don't really like that. And the last sort of approaches which have been used or are used in the past or currently are model predictive controls. So you exploit some sort of extremely complicated uh, uh, equations, differential equations, mathematical models, uh, which has been studied over the last century, I would say, uh, by traffic engineers. And, uh, and you try and you can use these sort of models uh, for optimizing control signals timings uh, for larger regions, but only in the case of events that you can predict well in advance, uh, because it takes a lot of time to solve these sort of problems, uh, because they are computationally expensive. So you cannot uh, exploit them for reactive to something which is happening right now or which is expected to happen in the next 10 or 15 minutes, but you can use them, for instance, in the case of plan ahead events. If there is a festival, if there is a, a football match, uh, or any sort of sport event, these are the techniques, model predictive controls are usually exploited uh, for planning ahead uh, in terms of traffic signals. And uh, in terms of uh, the traditional traffic authorities, how do they operate, or at least how do they operate in the UK? So we had uh, a number of uh, interviews with traffic authorities from Yorkshire and Midlands mostly, uh, for understanding how do they analyze the situation and how do they take the decision. Now without you can't read actually in here. The important bits right now are the colors. So you have two uh, people or two roles actually, which play every day in the daily routine of traffic authorities. In uh, the part which is in gray are network monitoring officer, NMO or animal, as they are called in the jargon. Uh, and then you have in green uh, the control engineer, the traffic engineers. And uh, they have different roles and they play different role in the sense that Monitoring officers, well, they monitor. They check what's going on in the area, uh, and they report if there is anything which needs to be reported uh, to the engineers that decide if there is the case uh, for doing something or not. So taking a closer look, uh, this is the typical environment in which an MO will work. So a lot of screens for understanding what's the situation of the traffic. and. Uh, in the daily routine, what they do is they monitor the situation of traffic, which can be done by CCTV screens, uh, Twitter, Google Maps, uh, taxis, uh, buses, everything, for understanding what's happening on the streets. If there is something which looks suspicious, then they move on to identify, investigate, and inform. Identify means there is something which doesn't look like. What is it? And uh, actually, I found out that we found out that one of the easiest ways for understanding what's going, what is going on is calling bus drivers. You will have buses everywhere, or taxi drivers, and ask them, you are in that road or you are near that road. Can you see something? Can you tell me something? Uh, or of course, if you have CCTV in place, you can reuse them. And then uh, if, you investigate, uh, sorry, if you identify that something is wrong, you can investigate to understand if you need to inform traffic engineers, and in that case, you inform the engineers and the public about the issue. Uh, and then you have engineers, uh, which are taking the stage. And uh, that's a very different environment. So at least in, uh, in the UK and Europe, what happens is that uh, uh, they receive information from monitoring officers. Uh, they print out on paper the map of the area. They print out the scheduling of the settings of traffic signals in the area they sit down and try to understand what to do. Uh, of course, it's a quite slow process. So in most of the cases, uh, when they finish to verify and evaluate what to do, the problem is either solved by itself or is a disaster. So you need to implement something and then inform the public. And on top of that, there is the fact that if they implement uh, a solution, 
which come out to be uh, to lead to a traffic accident or to worsen the situation of a traffic, uh, they are legally liable for what is happening. So the general approach is uh, we try to understand everything. If we are 120% sure that we can deal with that and that we can improve the situation and that we can quantify uh, the improvement, we try to implement that. This is typically something that happened if you have seen the issue in the past. Otherwise, <coughs> you just let it go and you inform the public that they can face disruption somewhere. And yeah, having said that, I think I'm leaving the stage to Steve for related works in AI. Okay, thanks. So uh, what do I need? I need to click this, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So just to sort of set the stage, uh, maybe look a little more concretely at the problem that we're, we're talking about. What I've got here on the slide here is, uh, is sort of a representation of the, the plan, if you will, that the, the artifact that we're trying to build that controls the traffic signal. So typically traffic engineers will, will break uh, compatible phases, compatible uh, movements of vehicles. It, it, I will group them into movement phases. So you can see here we have an east-west phase where uh, traffic can move two and it's labeled two and six here. Here's a north-south phase. You can have turning phases and and so so the the signal timing plan that that uh, the kind of object that drives the traffic signals is kind of looks like this. It's just a sequence of these these phases uh, it can be of varying duration and typically are and. Um, you know, and, and so we, we execute that. Now, you, you kind of notice if you look closely on this particular signal timing plan, you notice that, that phases go in a particular order and then repeat. That's very common. Also, it doesn't have to be the case. Uh, some systems will vary that, but, uh, but uh, we're basically going to make the assumption that they'll stay the same. So with that in mind, then, you know, conventional uh, traffic signal systems, these plans are built in advance. They're pre-programmed. You, you sort of do some data analysis, you know, count, count cars for a day or two, figure out what the volumes look like, take a snapshot, and then on the basis of that, you d decide this. You plug the plan in, and uh, then it just runs, and runs and runs. It does the same thing over and over again. Adaptive signal systems, on the other hand, which, which are you know, more advanced kind of systems, uh, here we're trying to sense approaching traffic and sort of react dynamically to uh, in some sense, to the traffic that's on the road. So, uh, as Morrow said, uh, adaptive signal systems, this idea is not new. It's been around since, uh, since the 1980s. Uh, what I've done here on you know, here is grouped sort of the, the adaptive systems that are out there into sort of three categories. The, at the top, what I've called centralized systems that adjust timing plan parameters. Uh, they've had the most success. Uh, Scoot and SCAT are classical systems that, that do this. What they do is basically um, operate with a sort of a signal timing plan template that has three parameters. Uh, how much time you allocate to each phase is one. The splits, that's called the splits, that's one set of parameters. Uh, the, the overall cycle length of moving through all the phases, the second one. And then there's a third parameter that would be an offset between one intersection and a downstream intersection if you were trying to coordinate them. Uh, those systems uh, have had the most success. They're, they're somewhat limiting with respect, or can be limiting with respect to real time response. So uh, Morrow mentioned that they, they tend to focus on small clusters of intersections. Uh, they're, they're not particularly scalable, or you have all the problems of centralization when you, we try to scale. A second kind of approach, which I've called online intersection planning, this one, this does focus on the real-time problem, and uh, it, it really does extend very naturally to the network level here. Uh, this is more of a decentralized view, uh, and uh, <coughs> networks communicate with one another to, to, uh, to, to achieve network level coordination. So actually the, the system I'll be talking about later it falls into this category. Historically, uh, the, the, what's been problematic has been the computational requirements uh, associated with uh, solving this intersection control problem that, that really tend to uh, restrict you to very small horizons 
planning horizons like 15, 20 seconds ahead, uh, or you operate with an imprecision with respect to time so that um, you start to lose the, the nonlinear nature of the traffic flows. Uh, there is a third type of uh, system, at least in the US, uh, system called in sync. Uh, the idea here is somewhere in the middle. Here, if you know what the dominant flow is, say you're sort of looking at a suburban corridor, you, you kind of know all the time what the main drag is going to be. And if you know that information, you can take advantage of that. What this system does is, is sort of really build a, a, a shared global timing plan for the main, and then they uh, use the adaptive system to manage the decisory traffic. AI-based uh, research has kind of looked at the traffic problem in, in a number of different ways. We're not going to cover all these in this tutorial. We're going to focus really on planning and scheduling approaches. But uh, just to give you a sort of a broader sense of, of what's been working, there's been a fair amount of work in, in looking at uh, this as a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, Anna Bazan was, was one, one of the original uh, proponents of this kind of approach. Uh, there's work going on at the University of Toronto. Uh, here, you know, the, obviously, the, the, you, can, you can see the, the kind of analogy to reinforcement learning. Uh, from, our, from my perspective, from a real-time control perspective, um, we've found that, uh, you know, sort of tracking, tracking traffic can be hard, that uh, there are often uh, significant discontinuities in traffic flows. Uh, as events happen, and uh, so we've shied away from that. But there, there's a, a lot of work work going on in that area. Uh, Peter Stone and his group, uh, several years ago now, uh, conducted work in uh, sort of what I've called here reservation-based intersection control approaches. Uh, the strong assumption that's made in this work is that we're in an autonomous world where all the vehicles are autonomous, and. Um, the idea, the basic idea, is then you treat the intersection as a, as a shared resource. Uh, actually, it can be, uh, you can cut it up into a, as many fine chunks of resource as you want. And then vehicles, you know, reserve time to move through the intersection. So there's no real need for a traffic light or anything like that. Uh, everybody's got their, uh, there is a centralized uh, booking uh, agency that makes it. Um, so. Uh, that's that's work actually that uh, uh, Alex Stepanovich uh, has produced an interesting result just uh, earlier this year, looking at the idea of that if you make a, a further assumption and uh, forget which, you know, no longer designate a direction to each lane, but let lanes be uh, allocated dynamically. Also, that you can you can actually improve improve quite a bit on on some of the original results. So. Again, that makes a strong assumption. Uh, we're not quite in an automated vehicle world where 100% of the vehicles are automated. Uh, Real-time schedule-driven traffic control, that's an approach that uh, was developed in my lab. Well, I'll be talking about that later. Uh, uh, mathematical models have, have also been used for network optimization, and, and Scott's group has uh, produced a very interesting new sort of formulation that, that addresses uh, some interesting classical problems. Uh, PDVL pace planning of, of traffic signals for congestion response. That's a, a, a technique that uh, Mora will be talking about later. So these are these will be the three core. I, I will mention one more. Uh, this is uh, an idea that's being explored by Didi, the sort of Uber of China. Uh, you know, like uh, Uber, Lyft. I mean, Didi has got his cars instrumented, knows where its cars are going. So it's got a tremendous amount of information about what, you know, what the traffic flows are over a, a network over time. Uh, what the approach it's taking, I've, I've called it here periodic data-driven timing plan optimization, but the idea is to, to um, use the data that's collected to continually generate new fixed timing plans. So, you know, the, the, remember I said the conventional one is you program in advance. Uh, you do an optimization based on a snapshot of data. Here you're collecting data continually. So I don't know if your snapshots ever converge or if you just uh, uh, continue to, to, you know, to make uh, fixed timing plans that sort of better match the traffic, but that's the approach that they're pursuing. So uh, if we uh, 
go to the next. So let's um, we'll move into the sort of main body of the tutorial uh, and talk about three different models that are uh, really fall squarely into the planning and scheduling realm. And so Scott, I guess you'll start. Okay, so this is uh, work that my uh, PhD student uh, in Australia, Ian Gillier, did uh, back in 2016. Uh, so just, who's familiar with SAT plan here? Right, the idea that you, you take a planning model, you just compile the, 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 the entire thing into some um, uh, set, set, satisfiability formalism. In this, kind of, in this case, I'm going to compile it into an optimization formalism. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that for traffic, basically. Optimize the entire thing end to end, give it a model. Um, as you'll see in a second, this is not a new idea. It goes back to the 70s, actually, for traffic. Um, so the idea is we want to encode a macroscopic model of traffic flow. We want to set the initial state. We want to set the, we want to set the traffic signals, which, of course, we do want to optimize later. But if you knew the initial state, you knew the traffic signals, then just predict over time with some macroscopic model, macroscopic meaning counting, looking at counts of cars, not individual cars, <clears throat> to predict uh, the counts at all the uh, intersections over time. Uh, so that's our model, right? Um, we have a few ways to do that model, which, are, which is really the topic of this work. Uh, we want to optimize some objective, right? And the nice thing about an optimization approach is you can define whatever objectives you want. In this case, we're just going to minimize delay, but you can think of minimizing stops or emissions or all sorts of things related to how cars uh, travel. Um, and so if we have a model of traffic flow and we have the objective, uh, then we can just use optimization tools. Because a lot of these variables are going to be continuous, uh, we need to use things not like SAP solvers, but like MILP, mixed, mixed integer linear program solvers. Okay, now this work has already been done. In fact, uh, the idea does go back to the 70s, I think with OPAC and Rhodes, or um, I mean, this guy um, Gartner at MIT was, was saying, hey, you, let's use nonlinear optimization, right, in the 70s to, to optimize traffic signals. And it took him decades to actually get that working in practice, but I think he did uh, around 2000. Um, but uh, if you look more recently in the literature, there are two main models people look at for modeling traffic flow. One's called the uh, cellular transition model. Um, and the other is called the link transition model. Uh, and I'll cover briefly what those are, but why they don't work so well for traffic control. So the CTM uh, basically divides your road into segments, say 20 meter segments in this case. Um, if you know traffic, if you, if you know traffic uh, theory, uh, the first thing you'll learn is the fundamental diagram of traffic flow, which relates density uh, to flow. As your density along uh, some road increases, your flow increases. But if you did get dense enough, then cars slow down, right? So you flatten out. And then uh, if your density increases too much, you get to what's called the jam density, right? You can't get more dense than that. Um, so these are, so this is sort of the nonlinear uh, dynamics of traffic, which you want to model. And the CTM does this. It models the K, which is, uh, um, K, which is density, and Q, which is flow. And if you, you'll note that K divided by Q is meters per second, which is velocity. Uh, so it models uh, flow and density directly, and then velocity implicitly uh, for every cell. Okay? Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good model uh, developed by DeGonzo. Anywhere, anyone know where DeGonzo is? Yeah, he's here at Berkeley in Civil Engineering, right? It's quite, quite famous for this model. Uh, because it really did recreate these things called shock waves. You're driving down a highway, suddenly you hit this density wave, right? Traffic slows down, right? And that really is a, a, a density wave. It's actually it's a wave propagating through the traffic, uh, and it, 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 it tends to propagate backwards um, over time. So the, the, the density wave you hit right now, uh, five minutes ago, may have been a mile ahead, right? That's just a wave propagating through traffic. And this was the first macroscopic model of traffic that could actually model density waves. Um, so uh, it's great work. When you use it to model traffic signal control, you have to divide roads up into very small sections, right? And you model those very accurately, but then just compile a city into this model, right? Too many variables. Uh, it's a great idea, but it doesn't scale. That's the main issue. Uh, on the other end, uh, the, the other extreme, you have the link transition model, uh, which also beautifully recreates shockwave effects. It only needs one variable for a very long section of road. Uh, with the uh, disadvantage that you only get sort of one boundary between dense and non-dense traffic uh, in the LTM. 
Uh, it turns out this is unfortunately too coarse uh, to really model what's going on. Especially, I, I think one thing that Steve's model covers well, which, uh, which you want to do in traffic, traffic signal control, is handle platoons, right? You have a group of cars traveling together, always limited by that slowest person in front, right? But it's, this platoon of cars is coming down the road, and you want those to go through. And you really can't model that well with the LTM, which basically says there's a high density and low density uh, region. You, do, you don't know where that, you can't model where that platoon is in the middle of the road, and that's really critical to good signal control. And I think Steve's, Steve handles that better probably than anyone, um, at least at scale. Uh, so th this is two course. Um, so enter, and this is what Ian did, the Q trans transmission model. It is, uh, has higher fidelity than the LTM, but it's way more compact than the CTM. And it's only, there's one key insight. Obviously, I can't cover all the details here, and I don't intend to. Uh, but there's one really beautiful creative insight that Ian had, which I want to try to hint at. Um, so we're going to model all of our, uh, we're, we're going to model our intersections uh, for city, and uh, we're going to model one, one variable per link per time step. So it kind of looks like the LTM, right? One variable per link per time step. Um, but there's a, there's a brilliant way that Ian can model more than just one boundary uh, between dense and non-dense traffic in that link. Uh, and here's my attempt to explain it. Um, OK, so we're modeling the count of cars in a queue over time, right? So we have three queues, Q1, Q7, Q9, right? They're here in the center. Uh, and you can see that, you know, uh, as Q1 increases, that traffic uh, transitions to Q7, that traffic uh, some delay transitions to Q9, and so on, exactly what you would expect uh, for the traffic flowing down. Uh, but how does Ian have this very compact model that only has one count per time step, right? But can still model more platoons than what the LTM can with just one, one, one boundary. Um, so here's the idea. When Ian wants to update at a time step, so, if we're, so don't really just absorb the encoding. Don't don't parse it. Um, <laughs> uh, when when Ian wants to wants to model like what's the contribution of Q1 here, he's going to look back in time. So he knows what the delay between the intersections is. Right, that's usually a fixed time. How, how long does it take to propagate it at a fixed velocity? Uh, and so he'll look back in time and interpolate right how many cars uh, if lights were green. Uh, would have been at, the, at that, uh, you know, 35 seconds back, they would have propagated down to uh, Q7. Okay, so e e even though we model discrete time steps, you can still do a, li a linear, interpret a linear inter inter interpolation to get the right count because it is a piecewise linear model. Um, but here's the brilliant thing. Um, this is not a homogeneous model. So we're, we're allowed, you can see over here, to have uh, time steps at closer intervals, right? We're not, we're not, we, we're not required to have a fixed delta T. And if, if we were to put in more time steps here, uh, you would actually be able to model more platoons coming down the line. Um, so it's interesting. His, his platoons don't, in the CTM, in the CTM, you know, you basically had one platoon that you could model per cell, right? In the LTM, you only had uh, basically one boundary between dense and non-dense traffic. But basically, in Ian's model, he doesn't model platoons with spatial variables. He, he models them with the time steps, right? Uh, uh, the more time steps you have, the more platoons you can model coming down the line. And I thought that was brilliant. So then he spends a lot of time figuring out what the right delta t is to get good models. And that's part of the paper. I won't go into that. But, but I, I thought it was interesting how he models platoons in, with time, not, in, not with the spatial variables. And I thought, if you read the paper, that's probably, for me, the most brilliant insight of that. Um, OK. So anyways, just quickly, what, what do you optimize in traffic control? Well, you can look at a network. You know, you sort of have boundaries for inputs and outputs. You can look at all the cars coming in over time. Say here, 200 cars enter the network, and they've all entered by time 100. And then you can just count the cars leaving the network and what time they leave, right? And then so what's the area between the entry line and the departure line? X-axis is seconds. Y-axis is cars. So area is cars times seconds. It's actual total delay, right? And obviously, if you could minimize the area between these two curves, you'd minimize car seconds uh, of waiting time. So that's a pretty natural objective, uh, one that others have used. Um, easy to formalize. Just absorb that. Um, OK. So finally, I mean, how does it work in practice? Uh, it, 
I, I, I will say fix, good fixed time control does pretty well, especially in a rush hour situation. You don't have a whole lot of flexibility in rush hour to do too much. Uh, so you won't see going from like a delay of seven minutes to a delay of two minutes, right? Unless you had a really bad fixed time control. So we do get a modest improvement, right? You look at the heat map, you get lower delay here uh, on this key arterial road, right? And about 10% improvement is typically what you might, uh, I see you might disagree, but, but I think with good fixed time control, we tend, 10 to 15% improvement is what you could expect uh, with good control. And so he does achieve that. Um, okay, so just a quick summary. Right, it's to date I believe the most compact direct op optimization model uh, that can still model platoons uh, fairly well, um, and I think the insight beyond the way Ian models here is the following idea that if you ha you know we know how to control traffic in arterials right you know everyone knows the green wave right? you're driving along the lights just turn green in succession for you right uh, that works if you have an arterial with a dominant direction of flow. What happens in New York City with a grid? Is there some ideal green wave for the entire grid? No. One direction gets screwed, the other direction you know, gets, gets, the, uh, uh, it gets it easy, right? Um, so grids and other, uh, uh, other regions where you don't have a dominant direction along an ar arterial are very hard to control. And the thing about the MILP is, uh, given a good model, like, it will really find this very complex sequence uh, uh, of lights to make sure that everyone sort of uh, gets through an optimal way. Um, so, th so that's our claim to fame. Um, I, I mean, we'll say compared to Steve's work, right, which I think is super scalable because it's de decentralized, we don't really have a whole lot of hope of scalability right now. That, that is our, our bottleneck, right? Uh, these MOP optimizers only scale so much and you have to decompose and so on to scale them larger. Uh, but the one thing we will guarantee for the size of sort of tender sections that we can control is if the model's correct, we give you the optimal sequencing, right? And that's the best that you can do if there's not an obvious way to set a green wave. Um, okay, with that all, transition to Steve's solution, which scales. All right. Uh, okay, I'm gonna just click these. Uh, this is the problem that my lab's been focused on for probably nine, eight or nine years now. Uh, Mar Mario covered a lot of this stuff. I just want to highlight a couple things. Uh, you know, if you look at urban traffic control, um, traffic signals haven't really changed in 50 years. Uh, I think I said 40. Well, was, I, w I would have said 40 if I had that last none there. But, uh, y you know, they're, um, uh, they cost. Uh, they cost a lot. The congestion is, is very time-consuming, very expensive. One of the things I think is interesting. This is a recent kind of uh, study that drivers spend 40 percent of their time in, on surface streets in urban areas, and just sitting in traffic idling. Uh, you know, conventional plans are based on average conditions. You know, you take a you take a snapshot and you build a timing plan that matches that snapshot. Um, actual conditions can vary greatly, and more than that, they tend to change over time. You know, a city is a dynamic environment, you know, buildings are going up, uh, new things are happening, uh, traffic conditions are changing all the time. So very quickly, the, these, these plans start to degrade. The strategy is really um, that, you know, you should retime your signals. I think they say every two years, if you're a really high growth area, maybe every year. Um, just as an example, uh, Pittsburgh hasn't retimed its li lines since, or its signals since 2000. So, um, you know, the money's not there, they don't do it. Um, but the other thing that's sort of interesting about the current time is that uh, there is this sort of emergence of, of a lot of uh, sensing and, and you, you know, the opportunities to, to do a better job at tracking and, 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 and uh, Detecting approaching traffic, uh, cities when they re, when they upgrade uh, their intersections, they do now tend to put at least in the U.S. put above ground detection out there, so video cameras or something. Uh, but interestingly, they still do the same thing. They figuratively just point the cameras down at the intersection and detect the traffic that is uh, st already stopped at the intersection. So you know what we really want to do is detect the traffic that's that's 
coming towards the while it's coming towards the intersection, so it doesn't have to stop. So, um, so that's the problem uh, that we started looking at uh, quite a while ago. We've been evolving a system now uh, for about eight years called SureTrack, uh, Scalable Urban Traffic Control. The the problem we've really focused on is real time optimization of of traffic flows in urban road networks. So we're, we're uh, in, in contrast to sort of uh, uh, situations, s scenarios where you, you have a single dominant flow, we're interested in situations like grid networks where you have multiple competing dominant flows that change through the day. So you can't really count on knowing at any point in time what is the dominant flow. Your system really has to discover that, rediscover it, keep rediscovering it through the day. Um, our approach we call collaborative online planning. We operate in a totally decentralized fashion. So each intersection controls its own local traffic, watches through its sensors, uh, approaching traffic in all directions, and in, sorry, in real time builds a timing plan to move that actual traffic, move the traffic it sees through the intersection. Uh, intersections then communicate with their neighbors, share information and, uh, to achieve uh, coordination at the network level. So here's a sort of a, a basic idea, concept of operations. So here we're looking at a video, video camera. Um, we put a computer at every intersection. Uh, at the beginning of the planning cycle, the, the computer sort of takes a snapshot of, of the traffic that's, that's approaching in all the directions. And uh, as I was just saying, in real time sort of builds a uh, single t signal timing plan, uh, a phase schedule that uh, moves that traffic through. <laughs> it starts executing the, it starts, then starts executing the plan, uh, sending commands to the controller. Uh, at the same time, it sends to its, its downstream neighbors uh, what traffic it expects to be sending it expects to be sending their way. So downstream traffic signals doing the same thing, it's building its own local plan, but now it has an expectation of what traffic is coming down, down the pipe behind the traffic that it can see through its local sensors. So it can build a longer horizon plan. And that's really the key, um, the, the key that, that sort of makes this whole thing work. And then the whole process just repeats uh, every second or two. So very real time. The key technical, two t key technical ideas. Uh, the first is really to treat the intersection control problem as a single machine scheduling problem, a special kind of single machine scheduling problem. Intersection is the machine, the vehicles moving through the intersection are the jobs it has to service. Then there's change over time whenever you switch a lane or a switch a phase. We don't actually uh, schedule each individual vehicle though. We, we use an aggregate representation. We sort of group vehicles into clusters based on proximity. Uh, and that's what allows us to really sort of solve the problem uh, uh, efficiently. So we can solve the, we solve the abstract problem uh, exactly. And, uh, and that's what gives us our plan. And then the second key idea is, that, is what we were saying before, we communicate planned outflows to downflow, downstream exit. Uh, neighbors to give visibility of future input. So here's the idea of, of aggregation. Is, uh, so this is just a simple approach to a traffic light on the left there. You have, this is the information you're basically getting from your, your sensors, uh, where vehicles are uh, and uh, relative to the intersection <coughs> over time. And what we do, we do two kinds of clustering. First, we, what was called threshold threshold based clustering, uh, grouping clusters into platoons. Uh, and again, just based on proximity, close. Uh, and then a second kind of cluster is what we call an anticipated queue. Um, you know, these are vehicles that are already stopped at the intersection or expected to catch up to the queue before it clears. So given that, I should just stay here. Uh, here's our scheduling problem. Okay, so here's a very simple, you know, two-phase intersection. We have two streams of clusters approaching the intersection. 
one has currently has the green signal one has the red signal and uh, you know essentially the scheduling problem is just to put them into a, a total ordering um, and then once we have a total ordering uh, we can uh, develop that into a fixed timing plan total ordering is, is kind of like a flexible times schedule and then we can fix it it we can pick a specific timing plan from that so that's the problem and then the problem that we're solving right now is we just minimize cumulative delay of all the jobs subject to timing constraints for safety and fairness uh, so safety means you know will there always be a change over time when you go move from one phase to the other fairness constraints are really so that nobody gets starved out um, so you have minimax for each phase we solve this we can solve it a number of ways we use a forward dynamic programming search a uh, new job is added at each decision stage we do some tricks to eliminate dominant solutions and uh, we only keep the state for the minimum delay with the minimum delay for each extension so we're actually uh, using that's actually turns this into a slight heuristic procedure uh, the, the key idea is that if you look at the time complexity of this algorithm, even though it's an exact procedure, it, it's based on phases, so, uh, or it's a function of phases. So if you think about building a plan uh, a few minutes into the future, that's really only going to be three or four or five phases. So, um, you know, it's, from the standpoint of, of uh, generating the plan, it, it, it's fairly efficient. Here's what the setup looks like in the field. This is a, an older picture, uh, but here's a, we put it, I said we put a computer in every, in every intersection in the cabinet. It's connected to the hardware controller at the top. That's the actual device that runs the, the lights. Over here, in this intersection anyway, we're using video cameras as our sensing device. The other thing we need is, is communication. We need to be able to communicate with our neighbors. In a lot of urban areas, you already have fiber optic cable, uh, and that's perfect. That's, that's the best possible way. Here, we're using point-to-point -point radios uh, because we don't have that, that fiber. And this device here, I'll come back to later. This is, this is a, a dedicated short-range communication radio, DSRC radio. Uh, these can be used to communicate directly with vehicles. We first, uh, I'll just put this out, we first, we first uh, field tested the idea in, in 2012 now, so it's been some time. Um, what we did to evaluate was we did uh, drive-through runs with and without the system in the place and at different times of day, different days, multiple multiple uh, days. You can see that we, the improvements we get vary over time or period of day, but overall we're reducing travel times by about 26 percent. Uh, not because vehicles are really moving faster, but they're stopping 30 percent fewer times and when they are stopping they're idling 40 percent fewer less time. So the uh, so on the basis of those results we were able to get funding to sort of expand the network the following November, we doubled the size of the network to 18. We did the same experiment, got essentially the same results. Uh, we've now expanded a couple more times, and we're currently running a, a network of 50 intersections, uh, sort of on the east end of Pittsburgh. And uh, the city now has funding to add 150 more, so that will happen, be happening over the, the next uh, couple of years. Uh, this this is the east end of Pittsburgh. This sort of thing going down to the triangle, and you know if all goes well, in a, in a couple of years we'll we'll have all the signals there. That's uh, it's about a third of the signals in the in the city. Uh, we we are actually also pushing out the technology. We we formed a company, Rapid Flow Technologies, in 2015, and we're actually this says four. We're currently in five cities now. Uh, we've got six more lined up for this year and then a number of others we're looking at. So, so we are uh, making progress. What we've been doing uh, more recently in the, in, on the research front, a couple things. I, one of my students has been looking at the problem of uh, saturated traffic. Uh, if you think about the, the approach we're taking, we're building a, 
you know, we're, we're sort of organizing the input flows into clusters and then scheduling those clusters. Uh, if you think about as, as you approach saturation in a network, uh, think about the extreme, you're going to have one cluster in each direction. So the, really the problem is going to be cutting the clusters. Not, there's no scheduling problem anymore. It's just cutting the clusters. So what my student who Shay has been looking at is, well, how can we uh, combine some ideas from uh, queuing theory to uh, sort of take over that, uh, take over control in that kind of a case. Um, so he's defined this, this me measure, this, this idea of network pressure, uh, so corresponding directly to the level of congestion, and um, essentially adds a weight to the sort of evaluation function that allows it to, you know, sort of as congestion becomes more intense, um, shift more from optimizing to uh, doing queue management, which, which is, I guess, the best thing you can do in that case. And he's got some performance results that, that kind of show, um, these are in simulation, but he's gotten similar results in the field now um, that show that sort of in low, medium demand situations, uh, there's really no difference in the, the two. The, the schedule-driven approach is working well, but in high demand, Kind of cases you're you're really getting a, a benefit out of switching to uh, switching to uh, uh, the you know just queue management kind of thing. Uh, Huche has actually uh, refined that idea uh, into uh, or I guess more generalized that idea into sort of additional information flow now that we use sort of pushing information <laughs> upstream uh, as well as downstream pushing congestion information upstream. And uh, if you go to his talk on, uh, I think it's Monday, uh, you, you can get more information about that. Uh, he's got one in the technical conference here. Another one of my students has been looking at uh, <laughs> expanding the precision of the, the intersection control scheduling model that I talked. You know, I sort of glossed over a lot of details, but, but uh, one one thing we do one thing we do uh, to sort of or we did to simplify the computation is really when we're thinking about clusters for compatible phases we essentially fold those clusters together and, and just consider them uh, as you know together as as a unit. Uh, you can also think about treating each each directional flow separately, which is what this student my student Rick has done um, and. Uh, of course, that blows up the, the solution space a little bit, but um, but it does give you uh, uh, substantial improvement. So with a higher fidelity model, in this case, he switched to an extended a, a star search uh, to sort of cope with the expanded uh, um, search space, and has found a, a pretty nice heuristic. So just to end my piece here, uh, just to sort of summarize what I I see as the advantages of. of of the kind of approach we're taking here. The, key, the big advantage really is that we're optimizing signals for the actual traffic that's on the road, not for some uh, average condition that, that we uh, We're emphasizing coordination for networks, grids, not just arterials. Uh, I didn't talk much about it, but uh, maybe at the end I'll come back a little bit to, to talk about uh, the fact that, you know, we can take advantage of information about traffic mode you know, whether it's a bus, whether it's a passenger car, whether it's a pedestrian, uh, and, and optimize uh, uh, for, the, for multiple travel modes. And then the other big thing is that we, you know, not only are we scalable, city scale, but uh, it sort of promotes a, 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 an idea of deployment, uh, of incremental deployment, so you don't have to sort of put forth a, a, a gigantic chunk of money and, and do your whole city at once. You can you can pick a particular pain point, start there, and then sort of grow the networks the way we did in Pittsburgh. So I'll stop for now and uh, turn it over to Maura. Thank you. So the last part <coughs> of the core is uh, what we have done, uh, uh, and which is called simplify, basically. So the approach in this case, uh, sorry, is uh, uh, to use uh, uh, planning, so PDDL plus planning, actually, uh, to deal not with recurrent congestion, but with unforeseen events. So in the case of disruptions or in the case of <coughs> accidents and things like that. You want to deal with something which is unexpected and you want to deal with it quickly. And 
Yeah, but just to give an overview of a simplified project, we move from a project which was uh, uh, shared between the University of Huddersfield and uh, a company called Confusion, and then we started in 2017 a sort of spin-off, which is 100% uh, dedicated to that. And that's the sort of painful process through which we have usually to go through, and that Stephen Scott knows very well. Uh, when you start with an idea and you try to commercialize that. And in terms of uh, speaking a bit more about the, the actual approach, so first of all, why did we use PDDL Plus? Uh, because we believed it works pretty well for the sort of uh, expressivity that you need and for the sort of way in which we were modeling the problem. So for giving a very, let's say, high level example, let's think about uh, a urban region as a set of water pipes, which are all connected. Now, the junction are places where the pipes uh, are connected to each other and vehicles are the water which is going through them. So what you want to do from a point of view of optimizing tra traffic signal phases is understanding when to open the different taps uh, in order to let the water flow as much as possible. And PDDL Plus works pretty well in this sort of scenario because you have processes, so you have continuous changes, so you can model the fact that the water is flowing or vehicles are flowing. And you have events which allows you to control limits, so when the pipe is full or when the time is over. And the only, there is only one action, actually, which is under the control of the planner, which is to decide when to open or close taps, so when to start or stop uh, traffic phases. And in terms of the required information, I think I probably can move to this slide, which is a bit more clear. So let's say that we have a very easy uh, network, which is like this one. What you need to know is, of course, links, which in this case are called road, and the different junctions, uh, entry and exit points of your network from which vehicles can enter or can leave. Uh, and then you need information about the roads in terms of uh, uh, the number of vehicles which are in there, so the quantity of water, if you want, uh, that can be inside the road at the same time. Uh, the traffic movements, so the flows, which are allowed uh, from a road to different roads through a junction, or that your road can receive through a junction from different roads. And in this case, these are uh, part of a PDDR plus model, which is representing on top uh, the current <coughs> condition that we call Q of a link and the maximum capacity of a link. Uh, then uh, the flow value represents the number of vehicles that can leave uh, your link through the junction at a given stage uh, per second. So in this case, uh, you have 0 0.7 cars <laughs> that can leave uh, through the junction. Uh, and then you have information about uh, uh, the signal phases uh, in terms of uh, for each stage, which is a signal, a, a single traffic movement a signal phase which is allowed, you need to know information like the minimum green time, so you have for safety and security reasons, of course, a, a minimum time for which a green must be on, um, otherwise you can have uh, accidents because vehicles start and then need to stop immediately. Uh, and you also have uh, a maximum green times that be, must be respected uh, for avoiding uh, uh, basically starvation uh, of the other part uh, of a junction. Uh, and then you need information about which stage is active, uh, and uh, the sequence of stages. So in this work, uh, following what has been told to us uh, from traffic authorities in the UK, uh, we don't modify the sequence uh, of traffic phases, uh, but we only modify the length of each of them. And uh, the only action, as I said before, which is under the control of the planner, is the possibility for a single stage uh, to switch the phase, which is currently on. So the planner has a model of a complete network, the PDDL Plus model allows the planner to simulate uh, how traffic is moving into your network, uh, particularly with regards uh, to the unexpected condition that you're facing. Uh, you specify the sort of goal, which is usually clearing uh, the link or the area uh, in which the event has happened. Uh, and then what the planner does is simulating everything and try to extend or reduce uh, the length of phases uh, according to the sort of goal uh, that you want to deal with. And uh, this is the, only, the, the main process in terms of PTDL Plus, which is controlling uh, the movement of vehicles. And that was one of the main reasons for using PTDL Plus. So this just allows you, uh, I'm not going too much into the detail, but uh, 
what this thing is doing is checking if the traffic flow is active. So if you can move vehicles, then uh, you are increasing the number of vehicles in the receiving link and of course decreasing from the same quantity uh, the outgoing link. And in terms of how does the plan look like, well, not particularly nice, uh, but it's just a sequence, uh, uh, a time sequence of moments in which you want to switch phase, so in which you want to change something uh, which is going on right now. So this is the sort of plan which is created uh, by the planner. In this case, we use ENHSP, provided with the PDDL plus model. And this is then parsed in order to either be understood uh, by traffic engineers or to be then deployed, in our case, in simulation. And the idea of the overall architecture is basically to have, uh, since we are dealing with unexpected events, so you expect to have, of course, uh, some knowledge of a traffic model in general and some persistent knowledge about the network that you are controlling. Uh, and then you need some dynamic, let's call it, knowledge, which is the current status of a network and in particular some triggers which allows you to say there is something which doesn't quite look nice or well. Uh, we need to intervene. Where intervene means uh, let's find out which sort of goal can deal with a problem and feed everything to the planner and hope that something come out uh, on time. And then, uh, which is a very good plus, you can simulate the plan, so you can give traffic engineers the possibility of checking before deploying uh, the expected results, so avoiding at least partially uh, legal liability, and then you can try uh, to deploy it in the physical world. And uh, in terms of the evaluation that we've done, that was mostly done uh, with Transport for Greater Manchester, the UK, and uh, initially started, I mean, the structure of Manchester was pretty nice for this sort of work uh, because you have two ring roads. One inner ring road, which is controlling mostly the downtown and the center of the city, and then you can just see it here when it's going all around, of course it's a ring, uh, which is the outer ring road, which, are the out, which is the highway. And uh, during the morning peak hour or in the afternoon peak hour, you have a lot of traffic which is traveling through these two links, uh, trying to get to the city center or away from the city center. And we try to uh, focus on that area and simulating the fact that there were issues mostly in this part here and try to check if we can redistribute the traffic or react to that by changing the traffic signal stages. And yeah, okay, that's just a schematic view of the area in terms of links, uh, uh, sorry, in terms of junctions which are under the control of the planner, so red ones, so these are those that the planner can directly modify. Uh, links, so roads and how they connect the rest, the main ones, and uh, the borders, which are in blue, which are still junctions, but which are not under the control of a planner and from which you can receive flow from inside or outside. And in terms of junction complexity, uh, we realized that for the planning approach, uh, the scalability issue was not mostly in terms of number of vehicles or in terms of number of junction, but in terms of number of stages and phases that this junction adds. And uh, one of the most complicated ones has some seven stages, and you can see uh, one, for instance, for stage one, you have three different traffic <coughs> movements which are allowed, and the same for the last one. And of course, between stages, you have also to consider intergreens, uh, which are not modifiable by the planner, but are this amount of times in which uh, all traffic signals are on red because you need to clear the junction uh, for avoid, hopefully avoid congestion. And we this depicted some test cases, which was focused on testing whether we can clear one specific link, a different one, links uh, which are, uh, uh, let's say, fighting uh, for the same resources, so which are incoming to the same junction, or the whole region. And as a side test, we were also checking whether uh, our approach for reducing congestion can lead to some benefit in terms of pollution. Pollution is not directly modeled into the PDDL plus, uh, which is quite complicated by itself. Uh, so we were just evaluating that as a byproduct, let's say, of the approach. And how can you test uh, this sort of things, so this sort of approaches? Uh, we thought about uh, three different ways uh, for validating and testing the approach. One is what we call the uh, visual inspection. So we simulated, actually, 
We identified the different test scenarios. We created plans. Uh, we passed plans in order to make them understandable uh, by traffic engineers. And we provide them with the plans. And we ask the traffic engineer, uh, does it sound correct for it? Does it embody your idea of common sense? Would they have done something similar for solving the problem? Or does it look completely stupid? And in most of the cases, uh, they found out that the sort of plans uh, which are provided by the planner uh, as what they call recognizable common sense parts. So if you provide them to an expert, they would agree that they make sense. We don't know if they work or not, of course. Uh, and then in terms of, uh, let's say, quantitative analysis, uh, we use traffic uh, simulators. So two, uh, the two main exploited one, which is, well, SUMO, is mostly for academic research. So it's not extremely uh, accurate, but it's pretty easy to use and you use a lot in research. And then AIMSUM, which is on the other end, let's say, of a range, uh, very used by traffic authorities, extremely expensive, uh, quite ugly to deal with, uh, but it is what it is. And uh, we compared it with what is usually in place in that area of Manchester, uh, which is fixed time manually optimized traffic signal phases. And we observe that, in general, uh, we have an improvement in terms of 25%, which means the traffic is moving, or actually the delay, is reduced by around uh, 25% in this case. And uh, the strategies in terms of length, uh, of course, it depends a bit uh, on the complexity of the problems that you have to deal with and on the amount of incoming traffic that you are expecting in the area. Uh, but usually that sort of strategies and plans uh, are produced for the next five minutes to half an hour. And using that uh, ENHSP planner, which is mostly by Enrico Scala, uh, mostly or very close to real time. So it usually takes around one minute to get your plan, uh, which can be OK, for instance, for half an hour uh, planning ahead. And uh, we were pleased, very pleased to see also that in terms of emissions, even though we don't model them directly, uh, on average, uh, the simulators uh, identify the 5% reduction. So this basically means, of course, it is correlated to the fact that if you don't let vehicles stop and start and go a lot of times, so you are reducing uh, the emissions in the areas. But it's pretty nice to see that uh, simulators agree with us. Uh, in terms of so far, we have worked with, mostly with Manchester, and we have tested things in simulation. Uh, now we want to move the simplified project to be done on the commercial side. Uh, but the, the first thing that we need to deal with is a specifically designed planning engine, because we think we basically hit the top uh, of a performance that can be delivered by a domain-independent planner, even though it has been extended with domain-specific heuristics. Uh, and we are working on that, uh, mostly with other uh, cities and towns in the, in the area. So we've Leeds, uh, and we've, of course, Huddersfield, that finally decided to collaborate with the University of Huddersfield. And uh, yeah, and the other thing, which is pretty important, and that we found out uh, to be quite interesting, is that different traffic authorities, so the traffic authority which is controlling the highway, or the traffic authority which is controlling uh, the Manchester or uh, the nearby towns, uh, uh, do not share information usually. So a very nice thing would be to find out a way uh, for sharing data and information from authorities uh, which are connected uh, and try to use this notion and this amount of data for optimizing uh, traffic in the future. And of course, we're also thinking a bit about connected vehicles. So we started recently uh, another project, again, from a very centralized point of view. Uh, but the standpoint here is saying, uh, uh, let's assume that uh, in the urban region in which we are working, uh, there are calves. And all the calves, uh, there are mostly or only calves. Uh, and they can communicate with a centralized urban traffic controller, which is controlling the area. Uh, if they communicate information like uh, uh, their destination, their preferences in terms of uh, paths or routes, uh, or the requirements of their drivers, uh, can this sort of information be used by an AI controller, hopefully based on planning, uh, for optimizing the use of a network? So basically distributing the traffic and uh, minimizing or 
optimizing uh, the use of the rules and things like that. And, uh, well, to be continued in the sense that we just started. Uh, we hope yes, uh, but we will know in a couple of years, I think. And Steve, back to you. Okay, um, so I'll just uh, finish up with uh, a little discussion about sort of where we might look to in the future. Um, these are uh, pretty exciting times in this area of uh, uh, what I call now smart infrastructure, uh, but, but uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, research directions. You know, uh, Moro just mentioned connected vehicles, the, the ability to, to talk directly with uh, vehicles and, and pedestrians for that matter. Um, behind them is coming autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're also seeing... Uh, you know, this, the notions of ubiquitous sensing uh, starting to emerge and um, so the opportunities for increased uh, sensing information. Multimodal trip planning is another uh, um, uh, increasingly important area. As, you know, sort of more and more people are moving to the, the cities and, uh, you know, sort of mobility is really going to, uh, you know, traffic signal control is one piece of the problem, but uh, uh, really to manage sort of traffic flows in, in the city, there, there really has to be coordination with, uh, with transit systems and, and other modes of travel. Uh, increasingly, cities are looking at sort of trying to integrate municipality <coughs> services, so if you think about uh, integrating traffic control with uh, snow removal, uh, you know, giving priority to, to snow vehicles, emergency vehicles, et cetera. There's all, all kinds of uh, opportunities there. And, and uh, an area that we've started looking at, um, what are calling sustainable infrastructure, but, but you know, uh, I'm, I guess I don't really know how it is worldwide, but in the U.S., the uh, sort of uh, procurement process or the process for maintaining and, and uh, and uh, building traffic infrastructure is really kind of broken. It, it, it all, all money flows from this federal t gas tax that, that uh, you know, comes, is, is essentially a shrinking revenue, serve, uh, revenue source and is going to continue to sink uh, as the world becomes, you know, vehicles become electrified. So, and it really puts a burden on, on municipalities, so, you know, it sort of keeps them in. So, uh, there are interesting opportunities, I think. I won't have time to talk to them today, but I'm glad to talk with anybody about um, how you might turn these sort of thing, use sort of smart traffic signal technology to, to uh, do tolling uh, or, or provide the opportunity to do voluntary kinds of tolling and uh, provide revenue streams for the municipalities themselves and and so, so there are a lot of interesting things on the horizon. Uh, what I wanted to do is just mention a couple things that that we've been doing in that direction. I mean we've been looking the last few years uh, mostly at integrating the signal control with this uh, vehicle to infrastructure communication you know if I think about that in the long term if I can imagine a world where uh, we're fully connected with vehicles uh, you know the effect on sensing is going to be transformational you know now we we get snapshots of uh, information as vehicles roll over particular spatial locations in your field of view of the sensor uh, in the future when, with connectivity you'll have continuous information about all the vehicles on the road so so the uncertainty is the, 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 which is fairly substantial associated with sensing today it, you know is, is, is going to go away and so so that in itself will will uh, you know enable a lot uh, more optimization but but um, what we've been looking at well if I think about that scenario it's still decades away uh, but what we've been looking at is well what can you do in the shorter term to enhance mobility where when the number of vehicles that are connected is, is small, relatively small, uh, and uh, is there anything you can do? Well, it turns, out, it, it turns out there's some pretty interesting things. We've been able to show, for example, that this idea of sharing vehicle routes. If a vehicle, if an equipped vehicle is willing to share its route, we've been able to show that uh, if, it, if an equipped vehicle shares its route with our traffic control system, we can immediately get them through our network 
substantially faster than, than otherwise on average. 20-25% uh, is, is what we're seeing in simulation. And, uh, I mean, and it's, it's, we're really getting that uh, without really adversely affecting vehicles that aren't equipped, vehicles that, that aren't in the road. So, you know, it sounds magical at first blush, but it's really simple. Uh, we're getting more information. You're, you know, uh, we're reducing uncertainty. You're telling us our route. We don't have to guess if you're going to turn left or go straight at the next light. You've told us what you're going to do. So as long as you follow your plan, you know, uh, we, can, uh, we can do a better job of optimizing. And so that, that has a couple of interesting ideas or interesting implications right away. I mean, first it says what we would expect, that as more and more vehicles become connected, the overall performance of the network is going to rise. Uh, you know, that, that's what we would expect. But, but it also kind of gives some incentive for being an early adopter. Uh, so, you know, imagine you're uh, a first last mile freight company. You know where your routes are in the city. If you're willing to equip your fleet, then uh, you know, we can Im improve your operations immediately. You know, same thing with ride hailing companies. Uh, same, you know, same idea. They, they, they know their routes uh, and so forth. So, um, there are a lot of, so th that, that's one sort of interesting area, and that's actually the area that we see uh, as, uh, as, as perhaps one vehicle for uh, introducing this sort of notion of paying a fee for the privilege of giving your, your route and being expedited. So you get something in return, and, and uh, you know, the infrastructure gets uh, something in return as well. So that's one idea. Uh, other things, you know, you can start to think about uh, doing uh, expediting transit in, uh, in, a, in a more intelligent way than it's done. You know, commercial systems out there do bus uh, transit priority, I think that is the term they use. Um, but they give, they, they do it by giving control unconditionally to the bus. It's often in the hands of the bus driver uh, is controlling the lights. So, Sure, the buses are being expedited, but the bus driver, I don't think, is paying too much attention to the other traffic on the road. So there are a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, with, with connectivity to vehicles to, to uh, doing a better job of expediting. Another thing that we're doing, we uh, have a contract with Federal Highway, is to develop a smartphone app, uh, in this case to support pedestrians with disabilities, uh, supporting them crossing signalized intersections in a safe way. So uh, it's a pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty natural idea. Uh, the, the phone knows how, you know, how fast you travel. And so uh, by communicating with the intersection and getting geometric information and things like that, it can, it can know how to request how much time uh, it, uh, the person needs to safely get across. Since the phone has a lo localization capability, we can also track progress to the intersection. And since we have a real-time traffic control system, we can even uh, dynamically extend phases if, if, if pedestrians getting in trouble. So some of the cap those are some of the capabilities that we're trying to, to operate. We're trying to also, uh, we're currently looking at trying applying the same idea of route sharing. Uh, you know, pedestrians with disabilities are often quite diligent with uh, in using one of the uh, navigation wayfinding apps to plan out their routes. If they want to go to a bus or other part of town, they'll pick a particular bus, plan their route out to the, bu to the bus. Uh, if they can communicate that route to us, we can, again, sort of anticipate their arrival at the intersection and maybe st streamline their process. Uh, another area that, to think about is, is what you can do with... Uh, Ubiquitous sensing. Um, we, we have a project where we're instrumenting uh, traffic, uh, well, intersections basically with low cost Bluetooth sensors and uh, using that information to essentially the original idea was to, uh, to just uh, be able to self monitor the performance of our networks rather than to have to do these physical drive-throughs to evaluate them at, at points in time. And it turns out there's enough Bluetooth traffic on the road that, that you can uh, compute, you know, trajectories, and then from trajectories you can get traffic, traffic flow efficiency kind of metrics. Um, so the, the, the obvious next thing you can start to think about then is, is you know, if, if I uh, 
you know, if I'm able to sort of get the real-time performance of the network, then I can sort of start to think about, well, their nominal conditions uh, and their exceptional conditions, and maybe then sort of use that kind of information to uh, detect, uh, do real-time incident detection. Yeah. You know, a traffic example, or a, I'm sorry, a traffic accident is, is one simple example, but uh, suppose, um, you know, suppose you have a vehicle, a uh, delivery vehicle parked in front of a, a store unloading for a half hour and is blocking a lane or, or um, uh, a road segment that's, that's closed for a week or two while they replace the pipes under the road. These are all things that you're not going to see in ways or... or or uh, Google Maps, or those kinds of things that, that you can get with this sort of real-time sensing capability. The other thing that's, that's interesting about, about, well, you know, we're building a plan for how the, the network is going to unfold in the next short term, say five minutes. But in that next five minutes, we probably have the best ground truth prediction of what's going to happen out there. You know, I was reading an article recently about I think it was in Los Angeles where, you know, people following Google Maps are all are creating secondary congestion because everybody goes the same way and, and so, you know, everybody wants to get off freeway because there's a hot back roads here and then they all do it at the same time and they create congestion at the exit. So, uh, if uh, part of the reason there is you don't have control of all the, all the you don't have uh, control of all the, or purview of all the traffic, and, and, and you don't have this ability to selectively provide advice. But, but in a traffic signal network where you're on the ground there, then, you know, if, if, if and you're connected to vehicles, if vehicles are willing to listen, then, then um, you know, maybe uh, you can give them better advice. So. Broader, uh, broader idea. I just think it's a it's a very exciting time. Uh, you know, as vehicle to well, as a vehicle pedestrian to infrastructure communication proliferates, and it will. It may take a while, but you know, originally in the U.S., it was going to be expected that Congress would mandate that all new cars would have these radios. Uh, that's not going to happen now. I don't think. But uh, the car companies are moving forward, you know, with their own ideas. And, you know, it's not clear exactly who's going to win the technology battle yet, whether, you know, it's there's sort of a beta versus VHS uh, competition going on. But, uh, but somebody will, and, or, or maybe both, both will. But it's coming. And, you know, as that happens, we think, uh, you know, the intersection has really become more and more a gateway for real-time information, and and uh, you know, as self-driving cars come along, they're going to use the same kind of communication mechanisms. Uh, you know, many of the self-driving car companies say today that you know they you know part of their part of automation will solve the congestion problem. Um, I don't think they quite have that one right, but uh, you know, I think it, it could eliminate a lot of parking garages, but. Uh, because vehicles will be circling all the time, but uh, it's I, I I don't see the the solution to the congestion problem per se. But uh, so I really think that that uh, you know infrastructure. We may not always need physical traffic lights or signals, but we will need uh, something at the intersection that's that's sort of taking a system level perspective and and, and optimizing. So uh, smart infrastructure is the key. Thanks. All right, we've got a few minutes. If anyone's got any questions for the three presenters, so I'll get down with the microphone. I have seen a lot of uh, equations, but I, have, I remember only one. The optimization is the number of cars multiplied by the delay per car. Why about reducing the number of cars? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I'm, I'm for all uh, I, all uh, efforts that uh, would reduce the number of cars on the road. You know, I, I think I mentioned once, and I, I, I agree with you. I mean, um, you know, one one way, you know, if I think about extreme ways of doing that, you know, like um, I think London's one place where you know you pay a fee to go into the city. That's sort of like a a blunt hammer approach to uh, you know, Stockholm doesn't let vehicles in the center city, 
Um, but, um, you know, there are, I think there are opportunities to do more uh, selective volunteer kind of tolling for, for benefit, and uh, th that should... And also organizing nightmare. Increasing the number of, uh, like Paris, like I'm French, huh? uh, you increase the number of uh, workloads, so the situation is absolutely crazy for cars, and people leave cars. <laughs> Number of what? Work, uh, work, yeah. uh, work on the road. Oh, work on the road. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a very French approach, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, we were working about that, or we were discussing about the work roads and things like that. Because in Manchester, uh, a few months ago, they started some significant work roads, and they said, "Okay, no, we have planned everything, and uh, everything has been set correctly." And they completely blocked the inner ring road for six months. So. One point about work roads is that in most of the cases, letting aside the, the Manchester case, uh, they are not planned ahead. So that's why probably you can have this sort of nightmares around Paris. Uh, yes, in, in Germany, they dynamically change the speed limits of portions of highways to absorb delays. Have you thought about it too? Uh, yeah, but. Usually, this is not a sort of technique that you can apply in central urban regions. This is currently applied in highways or uh, in uh, in ring roads and things like that. But if you're thinking about uh, the, the downtown, uh, you can't really slow down car much more. Also, you want to m move them away for avoiding pollution for people which are living in there. We've actually done a couple of know sort of basic experiments and and, uh, and other people are doing this are looking at this idea too of that if you know that tra in in the case of surface streets where you have traffic signals if you know um, the amount of I mean you you know your traffic signal plan whether you're generating it on the fly or what but um, you can think of uh, a larger solving a larger problem that is okay I have my platoons out there if I speed up one platoon and I slow down another platoon then uh, you know I'll have a better uh, place to shift phases and, and 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 there is value and you know if you if you're not stopping as much but you're just going at a slower space you are sort of doing the air quality uh, thing also so I, I think that's a great idea I, I mean I think there are a couple of researchers that have looked at some of that, but it's kind of a wide open area, I think. Um, so regarding the optimization, you mentioned this shortly in, this, in the decentralized approach that you also consider fairness. Um, because I, I was thinking if you're just minimizing delay, you will always have the problem that someone has to pay an extra cost. And how would you decide? So have you looked at different ways of defining fairness and how, the, how it makes a difference, like on the optimization? And then also I was thinking about maybe priorities sometimes can make sense. For example, you have an emergency and then you have an ambulance. Can you include this in the model somehow? Yeah, well, uh, they're, they're kind of related questions, I think, in a way. But emergency vehicles is kind of a special case because typically they just get unconditional priority. I mean, that's the way it sort of operates today. And, and in that context, sure, we could incorporate it. Uh, you know, we would do a better job of recovering the traffic after the fact. And possibly if, we, if they give us our, their route, we could clear traffic ahead of them, you know. so so. So that is one thing that we've done. Uh, but the other point you made, about, what about uh, um, uh, fairness? Um, uh, I guess there are a couple of things. The, 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 the traditional way of doing it is, is you put in min and max constraints. This is what municipalities do today, so that nobody gets starved out. But uh, you certainly, there are certainly areas where, or circumstances where you'd like to to perhaps prefer one mode over another. If I, if I look at, at downtown Pittsburgh, the Triangle, you know, at lunchtime there's probably more pedestrian traffic on the roads than there are vehicles. So, so you know, if you could prioritize pedestrian traffic, the way we the way we think about that, the way we do it is is just by weighting our clusters. So we 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 know what what the you know if we are if we can sense mode information. And know that the, you know there are so many pedestrians here, or, or 
along with vehicles waiting in this direction, then we can then we can do the waiting accordingly. I mean, that's how we've approached it so far. Um, I'm sure there are other ways to, to think about that, but it, it's, it's a good it's a good topic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious whether you've done any kind of user studies and um, talked to drivers. Do they notice any changes? Either I mean, presumably they're noticing that flow is going better, but yeah. do, do, do they? I mean, have you gotten reactions that you know the lights seem to be illogical now? They don't be behave the way people expect them to, or anything like that? Just anecdotal information, I guess. I mean, we have. Uh, you can. Uh, in some spots, you can really feel it's it's better, and so I, I do hear um, some comments like that. But then you know I get you get other uh, comments from people that have bad experiences, like a pedestrian that had to wait too long or, or something, and so those come back as negatives. So um, I think we get less negatives than we used to. So I think that's a step in the right direction. But uh, it'd be hard to do a well. I guess you could imagine doing a user study. Um, we've we've done that with the mobile app, that's but not the other. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, for uh, for the lead city in the UK, they have done some uh, analysis with the users uh, because they were optimizing uh, with fixed time strategies uh, part of the city center, and what they reported is basically every time uh, in which you are making some changes, people are unhappy of a change. Even if uh, their uh, their time to work or to going back home is improved, uh, that's because a lot of people, uh, for the commuters particularly, uh, planned well ahead and they know exactly what's the minute to get uh, out of the house or to get in uh, into the road uh, to minimize the delays or to find out the best way for getting to work. So they have to change their pattern. Uh, but after a while, I mean, the main point that you are measuring is not uh, the direct reaction, but the fact that you have. Uh, less claims uh, afterward, or less people which are complaining via Twitter, things like that. So, Steve, when um, uh, when you start with vehicles sharing route information and location information and, and all of that, I'm wondering if you anticipate that there's going to be any kind of backlash from privacy concerns on on this from drivers. Uh, that's, I guess that's a great question. Um, I guess we've assumed that if it's opt-in, that they've agreed to share their route. Um, and no one's forcing anybody to share their route. So um, I guess that's how we think about the, the privacy. Um, there are certainly other privacy issues with, you know, the, the, the way I don't know how it'll end up, but if I if the, if you look at the DSRC example, they go out of their way to sort of anonymize the information so that um, you know so that I, I don't know whether they they switch IPs every so often or something like that so that you can't really uh, single out any particular vehicle. But you're right. I mean, if if the, if the vehicle's sharing its route. I guess it's got to be an opt-in, uh, which would be fine with us. I mean, uh, uh, um, yeah, I, uh, that's the only solution I could think of on that one. Yeah. Okay, I, I think we'll have to end. We're kind of over time, but you guys can take it up offline. Just a couple more logistics things. We're back at two at Spark. We have a session on uh, preferences for planning and scheduling. Um, and also, given that this tutorial was on urban traffic, tomorrow morning we have another tutorial on uh, deep reinforcement learning for transportation and ride sharing. And that's actually by a few folks from DD Research and um, DD AI Labs. So that's tomorrow morning downstairs in one of the rooms. So it may, may be a continuation of some of the traffic themes that have been explored here. So let's thank our tutorial presenters again, and we'll be back. Thank you.